here with you all today and looking forward to all that God has in store for us. Um, I just want to echo exactly what Pastor Glenn was talking about. Just a moment ago, we worshiped, and just a moment ago, we had the chance to sing, and in just a moment, we're going to open up God's Word, but we're here today and able to do this because of the sacrifice of so many, amen? And we recognize that and remember that today, and we give God praise that He has put together people, men and women, who would give such a high sacrifice to afford us this opportunity. We're so grateful to be back at Sarasota Baptist. Um, this is a place um, that, if I haven't met you yet, is, is really near and dear to, to our hearts. Our family is literally, uh, r- literally woven into the fabric of Sarasota Baptist, and you're woven into our story. In fact, it was funny, as I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the announcement video up there, I see Mackenzie Gregory, who was the flower girl in our wedding, uh, right here. And as I remember it, she was the only one that made it to the end uh, of the actual road there. The other two had to be wrangled and pulled off site. Okay, but she made it to the end, so good job, Mackenzie. Now all grown up, and so we're just so excited to have the opportunity to share this time with you today. And I want to share with you just a, a quick story to open up our time together in God's Word, uh, to kind of tell you a little bit about where we're going. How many of you out there have more than one child? Anybody out there have more than one child? Yeah. So you will know exactly uh, how this feels. Uh, Pastor Glenn is sitting right here in the front row, and I remember I made fun of Pastor Glenn mercilessly when we served on the same staff at Hebron Baptist Church in Decula, Georgia, and I made fun of him because he had two older kids, and then, and then God blessed him with twins, and I was like, ha ha, eh, it's funny, you'd be you, you had twins, right? And then we had two older kids, and then God blessed us with twins at the end as well, so just be careful of what you make fun of other people with right there. And so with having, with having multiple kids, it means that uh, we've got 11, 9, 5, and 5, and they're all in different activities. It means that we have, are going in a lot of different directions on the weekends especially. And we have three of our boys, um, we have only three boys, our three boys played different sports um, uh, throughout the last year, but all of them played baseball in the spring. And I tried to help out and to coach as best I could with both the teams there. But if you know you have multiple kids, sometimes you end up in different places, And you can't figure out how I'm going to get from point A to point B. You can't split yourself in half. And we had one of those weekends a couple weekends ago in the baseball playoffs there. I've got Caleb over on one field, and he's pitching. And then I've got my twin boys on the other field. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do this. And so we just got to do what a lot of families do. We got to divide and conquer, right? So Beth, my wife, is going to go over to support Caleb until I can get over there. And I'm going to go coach up the boys until their game ends. It's a shorter game, and hopefully I can get over to Caleb's game and see what happens. But, But you know this, whenever you have those divide and conquer moments, communication is key right and so my wife and I are talking about what's the plan what's the game plan for how to make this work and she says to me I need you to make sure that you are responsible for the baseball gear so the baseball wagon the baseball bags the baseball bats the baseball gloves you got to make sure you get all that stuff at the end of the twins game bring it over to the other game and then you can head out on the field and help coach great I got this right we have a great game with the twins. They play really, really well. At the end of the game, I do a little speech. Here's the game ball, all that kind of thing. And then I make sure that I do exactly what I'm supposed to do. I've got the baseball bags. I got the baseball gloves. I got the baseball bats. I got the baseball wagon. Check, check, check. I got to get over the other side of the, of the ballpark. So I grab the wagon. I'm running to the other side of the ballpark. And I pull up there next to the bleachers. And my wife is already seated. The game is already happening there. And I pull it up there. And she looks at me. And how many of you know you've been married long enough that you don't even need words anymore? A look gets it done, right? And she looks at me, and her look is as if to say, you're missing something. And so I look, and I think to myself, look here, I've got the baseball wagon, I've got the baseball bags, I've got the baseball gloves, I've got the baseball bats, I've got everything. So I look back at her as if to say, woman, I have everything that I was supposed to do. I've got it right here. And she understands that her husband's a little dense, a little slow. And so she now verbalizes and says, hey, Steve, where are the twins? <laughs> I've left them. <laughs> so I ran back over. I grabbed one under one arm, one under the other arm. I run back over there and dropped them off, and it was fine, right? <laughs> Have you ever been there before? Has somebody ever counted on you to do something and you just didn't do it? I mean, it was within your ability to do it. You just didn't do it. I mean, you left someone hanging. You forgot something. You didn't show up when you were supposed to show up. You ever been there before? I mean, if you've been married long enough, you've had kids long enough, you've had friends long enough, I mean, you're going to have a moment where you disappoint somebody, where you just don't exactly do what you are capable of doing, where you disappoint somebody. You don't show up like you're supposed to. Let me ask you a question today. It's one that I think it's really important that we consider. What do you do, though, when it seems like God didn't show up? What do you do 
when you have a big blank in life and you ask God to fill it in and, and he just doesn't for one reason or another? What do you do when you've asked the Lord to do something in your life and he's not chosen to do it in the way you would have hoped? And today I want to take you to a passage of scripture where that is the case. If you have your Bibles, go with me to John chapter 11 today. And here's what you're going to find when you get there. You're going to find a family. And this family is close personal friends with Jesus. You know, it's one of those things where we always think about Jesus having disciples and followers and crowds of people. But he also had close personal friends. And, and, and three of them was a, a family and this small family, two sisters and one brother, they loved Jesus. Every time Jesus came to town, he would spend time with them. He would eat with them, might even stay in their home. It's Martha, Mary, and a guy named Lazarus. Jesus loves these people. They know him. He knows them. And there's this moment where one of them gets sick, Lazarus. He gets sick, and he gets so sick, and it's so serious that they actually send word to Jesus. Now, Jesus is not in town. He's about 100 miles away when he receives word that Lazarus is sick. But the Bible tells us that upon hearing that Lazarus is sick, and it is very serious, and they ask him, please come, it's urgent. The Bible tells us that he stays two days where he was, and then chooses to come. And as we pick up the story here in John chapter 11, verse 17, the unthinkable has happened. Lazarus, friend of Jesus, has died. And we're coming upon a family that is really just wrecked, and they're broken, and they're wondering, why didn't Jesus show up? Why didn't he fill in the blank like we asked him to? It says this in verse 17, Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now four days is significant. Because you see, at that point in time, there were uh, rabbis and religious teachers that would often teach that if a person had died for about three days, their spirit or their soul would hover near the body. Now that's not a biblical teaching, it was just one of the Jewish teachings at the time. And they said that the spirit or the soul would hover near the body for about three days. But after that three days, it was over. There was no chance of recitation. There was no chance of revival. Because at that point, the body literally began to decay. And there was no hope of there being new life to come into this body. Spirit and the soul would depart. And so when you're picking up on the story here, it's day four. There is no more hope. Nobody expects Lazarus to raise from the grave. Not even Jesus could do that. You have to understand, as we're about to read this story, I understand that many of you, you've grown up around church, or maybe you're new to church, but you've heard the name Lazarus before, and you kind of get where it goes. But I need you for just a moment, if you could suspend understanding or knowing the end of the story, there's so much for us to learn here today as we watch what Martha does in this passage. When it says here in verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, and Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Hey, Jesus, I asked you to show up, and you didn't. I asked you to heal my brother, and you didn't. I had a big blank in my life that I asked you to fill in, and you didn't. You left me hanging. And what we see here in this interaction between Martha and Jesus is something so profound, something so important for us to stand, understand in our faith as well. It really deals with the question that if you walk with the Lord for any length of time, you will face a question that may have already robbed some of you from a vibrant walk with the Lord. A question that actually may have kept some of you from even ever believing in Jesus in the first place. And the question is this. I've already said it once, but here it is. What should I do when God doesn't seem to show up? In your marriage? In your health? If you're the child that feels far from the Lord? When you ask God for the opportunity, for the protection... What do you do then? And I think this question is especially important. I actually had prepared to, to preach an entirely different message to you today. And then as I was talking with my wife about it, she said, I think you need to go in a different direction. Sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks really powerfully through your spouse, right? 
And she said, in light of all that's happened this past week and the great sorrows, maybe it's better for us to consider a different kind of question today. It's been a hard week, hasn't it? What do you do when it seems like God didn't show up? Martha sometimes gets a bad rap. Say, oh, she's just too busy for Jesus, right? And you kind of see that in different passages of Scripture. But right here, I think Martha gets it right. And she does three things, three things that are powerful reminders and powerful examples for us for what should we do when God doesn't seem to show up. And here's the first one. Write it down. Go meet with Jesus. It's interesting because when Jesus comes up, You've got Mary, who's already sat at the feet of Jesus, right? Mary, who's always known as the one who had this great devotion toward Jesus. But what does Mary do? She stays in the house. What does Martha do? She hears that Jesus is coming to town. She gets up and she goes to him. She doesn't run from him. She doesn't reject him. She doesn't hide from him. She goes right to Jesus. And when she goes to Jesus, what does she do? She doesn't pull any punches. She says, Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, I've got hurt, I've got brokenness, I've got pain, I've got questions that need answers. And she brings all of that right to Jesus, which is different than what many people do when hardship comes in their life. For many folks, when something hard happens, something happens that we don't understand, we end up running away from God instead of toward God. But we see Martha do something different. She says, I'm going to run toward God even when it hurts, even when there's pain even when I'm confused and I don't quite understand what's happening. There is a better way than abandoning your faith when hard things happen. And it is to take all of that pain and frustration and brokenness and bring it right back to a God who is ready to hear, and listen to me, ready to heal. So a few years ago, I'm a student pastor and I'm serving a church in Birmingham, Alabama. We're at, at summer camp. And we're at this summer camp experience, and we're out there playing recreation, and I'm in my early 30s at the time, and I want to show these kids, I've still got it, right? And so we're out there, we're competing in this game, and it's this relay race, and I'm competing against these junior and senior guys, right? And so I've got to show them, I've got what it takes, I can take them down. And so we're at this foot race at the very end of the relay, and I'm neck and neck with them, I'm hanging tight, but I know that they're about to pull away from me because they're a lot younger than I am, a lot more in shape than I am. And so they're running with all their heart, and I think to myself, I can get to this last station, and I can grab this cone that's at the very end, because whoever gets the cone wins. I can do that if I make a flying leap right now. And so I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and then I make the flying leap, and I stretch out, and when I hit the ground, I know immediately I'm injured. Have you ever had something where you didn't have to wait to feel like, oh, that's kind of sore later? Like, you just knew immediately there's a problem, right? I landed, and I absolutely destroyed this shoulder right here, just absolutely destroyed it. But I want you to know, Sarasota Baptist, I won the game, all right? That's important for you to understand. <laughs> I destroyed this shoulder, and I really, I lived with it for about two years and then finally, I just literally, I couldn't even pick up something over my head anymore. And so I finally decided I'm going to go get the surgery, I'm going to get it done. And I got into the post-op area there, and the doctor comes back. He says, that is the worst shoulder I've seen in a man your age ever. I mean, total torn out rotator cup and, and labrum and bicep reattachment. I mean, just the whole nine yards, right? I had to have the whole thing done. And he said, now here's what you're going to do. Tomorrow, you're going to have to go to physical therapy. Now, some of you are laughing. And some of you, it sends shivers down your spine, right? Because if you've ever had to do PT, physical therapy, before, you know it is uncomfortable, to say the least. In fact, I showed up the very next day for my first PT appointment, and the lady sat me down there, and in the most kind and compassionate way possible, she said, you're going to hate this place. And I'll be honest with you, I think she kind of undersold it. I mean, really do. <laughs> I mean, I would tell my wife, I was like, baby, can you drop me off my one-hour torture appointment and pick me up with painkillers on the other side? You know, I mean, it was just, it was bad. But I kept on coming. Every fiber of my being did not want to go to that place because it was excruciating and it was painful and it was difficult. But you know what? I kept coming back and kept on coming to the appointments. And as I kept on doing that, you know, over time what happens is I got a little stronger, healed up a little bit more. The pain began to dissipate. And eventually this shoulder was stronger than it even was before the accident. Let's take it to the spiritual for just a moment. Sometimes when you come to the Lord, you're limping on your way there, Right? Sometimes when you come to the Lord, it's difficult, it's hard, it's painful. But if you will keep coming back to the Lord, He is the one who brings healing. He is the one who brings comfort. He promises us His peace. Where else should we go in the midst of hurting and pain? 
but to take all of those sorrows right back to the Lord. The first thing we do when it doesn't seem like God showed up, we go and meet with Jesus. That's what Martha did. And I want to show you this next step of faith that she took. Look at verse 22. It says this, But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, but Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Look at what Martha does here. Write it down. She goes back to the truth. You've got to go back to the truth. And she does this in a couple of ways. Look at what she says. Look at the statement she makes here. She says, Lord, I still believe that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. In other words, she's saying, Jesus, I still believe there's something different about you. I still believe that God hears you. I still believe that God moves through you. I still have faith in you, Jesus. Now, you need to understand this. This is not Martha subtly asking Jesus to raise her brother from the dead. She doesn't believe that's possible. And we know that because later on in the story, when Jesus is literally standing at the tomb of Lazarus and asks that the stone be rolled away, who's the one that says, stop, don't do it? It's Martha. She says, don't roll it away. There'll be a smell by this time. I can't, you can't bear to look. This is not what I want to have happen. She doesn't believe that even Jesus can raise her brother from the grave. But she does still believe in Jesus. It's incredible, her faith. And then the second statement that she makes here is she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She says, you know what? I still believe that God will have the final say. I still believe that there is a resurrection to come. I still believe that heaven and the new creation is ahead. I still believe I still have faith. Martha is struggling, but she does something remarkable. She goes back to the truth that she knows, back to the foundation even when it's hard. See, for all of us, we have a foundation. And the foundation is so very simple. You could put it this way. God is good. But then something happens in our life that's bad. So you have God is good, but this is so very bad. And then you have a choice to make. You either say, God is good, but this is bad, so therefore God must not be so good. Maybe everything is bad, maybe everything is all wrong. Or you say, God is good, this is bad, but I still believe with all my heart that God is good. That his promises are true. Can I be a little transparent with you today? A couple of weeks ago, was a man named Flip Johnson's 50th birthday. He didn't make it to his 50th birthday. He died at 49 years of age. Left behind his wife, his three kids. Didn't get a chance to see one of his sons get engaged. To see the adoption go through for his little girls and his grandbabies. He left behind a thriving college and 20-somethings ministry. Glenn and I served with him at Hebron Baptist Church. Flip Johnson was one of my very best friends. And I'll never forget, and he called me the night of the diagnosis. We talked all the time. And he and his wife and me and my wife were on the phone, and he told us about the cancer and what the doctors were saying, and we just wept together and we just prayed together on the phone that night. And we prayed for weeks, and we prayed for months, and we asked God, heal him, preserve his life. I sat at his bedside last summer in Northside Forsyth Hospital in Georgia, and I asked God for his life, and then he died. And I got to tell you, it really did feel like a moment when God didn't seem to show up. And then went to the funeral. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most spiritually impactful things that's happened in the last several years of my life. Before Flip passed away, he designed his own funeral to be a reminder of the truth of who God is. Now, I know you've probably been to a lot of funerals, and so have I. This is different. We sing a couple of hymns, say some nice things, but this was a full-on worship service. I'm talking 90 minutes and about an hour of it just singing praise to God. 
And when you got your hands in the air and praise to God and tears running down the side of your face and something terrible has just happened, but you know the truth that God is still faithful. He's still good. He has not failed and he did not fail flip. He brought him into his presence in heaven forevermore and I will see him again. When you have those pre- the promises, you go back to the truth. You get through to the other side. See, for some of us today, we go, need to go back to Jesus, and then we need to remember the truth about who He is, who He promises to be in our lives. And because of Martha's faith, because she goes to meet with Jesus, because she continues to believe the truth about Him, Jesus says something to her that He had literally never said to another person. And it wasn't just for her, it's for all of us today. But he says it specifically to her in the midst of her pain. Look at what he says to her in verse 25. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Write it down today. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, don't get it twisted. He didn't say, I resurrect people. He says, I literally am the resurrection. He doesn't say, I came to give you a better life. He said, I literally am the life that you need. He's saying, you will find your resurrection, your hope, your peace, your life in me. That's who I am. And he reveals this to Martha. But then understand, at the very end of that, he asks her a question. Do you believe this? Now watch this. Martha's got to make a decision here of whether or not she's going to believe this before the miracle. In fact, she didn't even know if a miracle is going to happen. She didn't even think a miracle is going to happen. She's got to choose to believe while her brother is still dead, while her heart is still broken. She's got to choose to believe in the midst of her sorrow. Jesus asked the question, do you believe this? Will she trust Will she believe? And look at what it says in verse 27. Martha says back to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Notice and see her remarkable faith in this moment that says, Yes, Lord, I believe. But notice that not only does she believe in Jesus, her faith is actually elevated in the middle of her sorrow. She says to him, I believe that you are the Christ. She's never said that before. I actually believe that you are the Messiah, the one sent by God to redeem all mankind. In fact, I believe greater than that. I believe that you are actually the Son of God who's coming to the world, that you are divine, you are God. And what she finds in Jesus in this moment is that he is more than a friend and more than a teacher and more than a miracle worker. He is Messiah, the Son of God. Because she comes to Jesus in her sorrow, she sees something in Jesus she's never seen before. She's found him in a whole different way. Write this down. Here's the third thing that we need to do when God doesn't seem to show up. We need to listen to what God wants to teach us. Martha was listening, and she got the message loud and clear that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. She caught what God was trying to teach her in this moment. One of the most important lessons we'll ever learn in our spiritual life and our faith is that instead of asking God why, we need to ask Him, what do you want to teach me through this? And Martha found out. He's the resurrection. He's the life. He's the Messiah. He is God. The truth is, is that some of the ways that we grow most, spiritually speaking, are in our greatest sorrows. Don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that God wants to cause sorrow in your life to teach you something. But we do live in a broken world, don't we? There's a lot of darkness around us. Don't you see it? But God can take even those moments, the darkest disappointments and our most broken days, and He can bring hope and peace and healing. That's who He is. That's what He does. He desires to teach us. Now, to this point, I've really chosen to stay in the middle of the story. Verse 17 through 27. John chapter 11. And the reason why I've done that is sometimes when you skip to the end of the story, you miss the lesson in the middle of it, right? But we do know the end of the story, don't we? 
And Jesus comes along and he does a miracle. So write down this point here. Even though the blank wasn't filled in the way you hoped, God is still working. Even when Martha said, this is the blank I need you to fill, I need you to, to, to heal my brother. And it wasn't filled in the way that she had hoped, but God was still working, wasn't he? He was getting ready, setting the stage for one of his greatest miracles. He raised Lazarus from the tomb. But don't miss the point today, though. Sometimes God doesn't do the miracle until after the tragedy, like he did for Lazarus. Sometimes he doesn't reconcile the family until after they've been torn apart for decades, like he did for Joseph. Sometimes he doesn't pull you out of the fire until you've been thrown into the fire, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sometimes he doesn't walk out of the tomb until he's already been crucified and buried in it. I've often said for years and years, and I do think it's true, that our God is the God of 1159. Have you noticed that? He shows up at the very last minute sometimes. But sometimes he's also the God of 1201. And he shows up after the midnight hour, after the deepest disappointment, after the greatest hardship. And it's in that space that sometimes he does one of his greatest works and some of his greatest miracles in our lives. Even though God didn't fill in the blank in the way in which you'd hoped, even though he didn't show up in the way in which you desired, don't ever mistake, he is still working. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? And I just want to give you an opportunity right now to take a few moments to pray. Are you here today? And because of some great disappointment in your life, you find yourself running from God. You find yourself hiding from Him. You find yourself angry to Him. And maybe today is the day that you need to instead come to Him. Come to Jesus, like Martha came to Jesus. And you can bring all your hurts Bring all your burdens and bring all your pain. He wants to meet with you today. Right now, maybe that's the prayer conversation you need to have from wherever you're at. Either right here in the room or watching online today. Others of you today, maybe you just need to come back to the truth. Come back to the truth that you know about God, that He is good. That His desire for you is good. That He's working even in the bad places in life. Maybe you need to come to the Lord today and You've been asking God why, 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 and maybe you need to change your question today. Right now in prayer, you need to say to the Lord, God, what do you want to teach me about you through the midst of this? Or maybe just with a heart of faith today, you need to come before the Lord to say, God, I believe that you are still working. And so I'm coming to you afresh and new today. I'm trusting you. I'm believing in you. Maybe today is the day you need to say, God, I know you're still working. Others of you today, you're here in this room or you're watching online, and here's your situation. You, you've never believed in God because you could not reconcile a God who would let bad things happen in a world that we live in. Even this past week, you've watched the headlines and you've seen the brokenness out there and you've seen what's going on. Can I just submit to you today, He is a God that is present, moving, available, and will bring healing even out of this present darkness. If today you would trust Him, Maybe he could bring you hope as well. Maybe today is the day you need to lay it all down before the Lord and say, yes, I want a relationship with God. Yes, I'm ready to believe. And if that's you today, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right here, right now. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a short prayer. And in the words of this prayer, what you're going to do is if you'll take these words and make them your own, you're going to take these words and say, God, I, I believe in you. I believe in your death and your resurrection to forgive me of my sins, and I'm ready to surrender my life to you, ready to walk in a relationship with you, ready to trust you, come what may. Can I tell you, if you take that step today, the most incredible thing would happen. You'll find a God who is not just there for you in your successes, but a God who is there for you in your sorrows as well. Today, if you need to know Jesus, your head's bowed, your eyes closed, but your heart wide open. Would you right now call out to him and trust him? Take the words of this prayer, make them your own today. Pray this, God, thank you so much for hearing my prayer right now. And I just confess to you 
then I am a sinner. I've disobeyed you. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive. And so right now, I surrender my life to you. I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want your free gift of new life. Thank you so much for hearing my prayer today. Now help me to follow you and to live in a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everybody, look right up here at me right now. I just want to tell you, I am just so very grateful for those of you in the room today, those of you watching online that have made the decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I want you to know that nobody in this church, I know this for a fact because I know this church, nobody has to walk alone. And so if you're new in your relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to take that card that's right there in the seat back in front of you and fill it out right now and just, just check that box and say, yes, today I met Jesus. You can come and talk with any of the pastors that will be here at the front of the room after the service is over. I know they would love to talk with you and to pray with you about your new relationship with the Lord. For others of you today, you've already trusted Jesus, but you're wrestling today with your own hurt, with your own pain. Again, knowing this church has to walk alone, you can take that very same card and fill it out. What is your prayer request today? How can we be praying for you? Others of you say, I need to pray before I walk out of the room today. Again, pastors are here and available to you. Come and find them and pray with them. But for all of us today, as we get ready to step out and to walk into this world that we know is very broken, let's not forget, our God is still working. He's working in ways that we cannot see to do things that we cannot even imagine. Let's remember our God is still working. Pray with me once more. Father, thank you so much for this message today. Thank you for the example of Martha. Thank you for telling us the truth that you are the resurrection and the life and that we can trust you. God, we come before you humbly once again to say that we don't always understand, but we always know that we can trust you. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Glenn. Amen. Amen. Let's hear it.